This will be the first of, of uh, several uh, sessions available to you, but I'll also mention that we have a quarterly Clash of the Titans point counterpoint discussion that you're welcome to register for. Our next one is July 22nd and will be on non-accidental trauma. Um, so if you have any questions about membership, uh, please be sure to give us an email and let us know. Otherwise, I'll turn the session over to Nelsi, uh, Jeff, and Maria Noor Alhuda. Um, uh, please, I'll stress to the speakers to try to stay within your time limits. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Rick, for this uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Nelsi Zanon, Chair of the Education Committee, and, and Jeff. Blunt, the uh, co-chair of this committee. We have the privilege to have you on board. And uh, this series will be uh, seven models. And uh, we will start with the malformation anatomy diagnosis and treatment. And we have the privilege to share this uh, moderation with Nor Maria that is uh, the World Federation uh, Medical Students and Residents uh, Committee. And uh, do you like to add uh, some additional information, Jeffrey, before uh, we call uh, Federico? Great, well, let me add my welcome as well. Uh, we have a tremendous panel of expertise from around the globe. Uh, this is a... Um, this is a all-star panel talking today about uh, craniofacial abnormalities, congenital uh, anomalies uh, of the head. Um, and we're gonna go through uh, a nice comprehensive program. Nelsie, would you like me to uh, introduce uh, Frederico? Would you like to, we can go back and forth. Whatever. Yes, yes, you can do it, please. So one, of the, um, one of the real leaders in uh, organized pediatric neurosurgery is kicking off this morning's uh, session, Frederico de Rocco uh, from France. He's gonna set the stage for, they're just talking about the basics of craniosynostosis surgery and we'll move on from there. Frederico, would you like to screen share and take it? So, thank, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to start this uh, webinar and to be with you to discuss about the synostosis. Uh, so uh, I'm going to share my screen. So I was asked to start with the basic uh, principles of the surgery. So already you know that is a pathology that will be treated by surgery, but this is a type of pathology that is normally not very well known by medical students. So it will be interesting to have some knowledge because even if it's a rare disease, as you will see later on, it, uh, it is important to know that it exists for the pediatricians, uh, not only those who will be uh, surgeons, uh, but also for uh, parents and uh, families. So uh, we're going to see uh, briefly what the definition of chronic synostosis, what is the pathophysiology, because it had natural history, because it's essential to understand the principle of surgeries, to know what the pathology is and what the problems that are related to the uh, synostosis are. We will not discuss long on the diagnosis actually because this is a topic that will be uh, uh, treated by uh, following speakers. So the definition of the synostosis, the, the, the synostosis is a heterogeneous condition related to the closure of premature closure of one of the sutures. These are images of the skull. You see here that uh, there is a coronal suture, the metopic suture, the sagittal suture, but one uh, coronal suture is missing. Here you see two coronal sutures that are missing on the left side. So, and you see also that the skull is deformed. So there is a deformation that follows this premature closure of one of the sutures. And we're talking about rare disease occurring in one out of 2,500 births, even though the actual incidence is an estimate. We don't know exactly uh, what it is in the different countries. We know that there are some variabilities among the countries worldwide, and probably in the last decades, the, the actual incidence of studies showed that it increased. So if we take places like Norway, in which there are a uh, very good registry because it's a small population with a few centers that are treating this pathology, 
the incidence in this center is even a little higher um, with uh, more cases that are uh, recognized. Uh, so, so for the series, it really depends uh, for the incidence on the series that you study, but it's around 100 out of 2000 births. So we have the closure of one suture, but sometimes it can even more sutures. So, so the suture is, uh, is what we could say the joint between uh, two uh, cranial bones. And when it's closed, so you will have uh, the, uh, a problem, as you saw, in the growth and shape of the uh, skull. So what is the pathophysiology of this growth of the skull? Actually, skull growth needs not only the suture, it needs also a bone, which are normal metabolism. It needs a growing brain and a competent dura mater. It needs also a good de development from the muscles point of view, from the psychomotor point of view, and also external factors that can be positioned on other pathology can play a role in the overall growth of the skull and shape. We have examples of a, a, nor a normal metabolism, like uh, you can have some diseases that affect like rickets that will affect the bone and also the skull growth. We have pathology like hydrocephalus in which there is increased size of CSF, the content increases and skull growth is modified. And on the opposite, we have the microcephal, in which the brain is not pushing enough and the skull will be affected. So what is important to understand is that in the first months of life, the motor of the growth of the skull and the shape of the skull is the brain underneath. So if the brain grows normally, you will have a normal growth. If the uh, brain does not no grow normally, you will have an abnormal uh, volume and sometimes also abnormal shape when the suture is affected. Why it is important to understand that is that because we can follow that with the head circumference growth. So it's essential for all a pediatrician to see not only the figure at the moment you see the child of the head circumference, but also to understand how was the growth during the months before, because it will reflect this uh, growing of the brain. So we have a proxy of the growth of the brain. And if the brain does not grow, you will have the microcephaly. There will be a problem. If the growth is excessive, probably there is a problem. It can be a tumor. It can be uh, hydrocephalus. And then there is the shape. The shape can be due to the suture, can be also by the position. Uh, and you will see that later on in other talks. So what happens in case of synostosis? In case of synostosis, of course, there is no two more story, there is no trauma, we have the problem coming from the suture and will affect all the other aspects. And we will see that. So the, uh, the, the embryology of the suture is complex. We know different stages of the uh, embryo. We have expression of different genes that will uh, uh, be found in, in this uh, uh, region between parietal bones and frontal bones, or between the two uh, parietal bones and uh, two frontal bones. And we have animal models in which we can induce mutation in those genes and will change the shape of the head and of the suture, as you can see here, uh, when we induce the mutation FHFR3 in the, the house, abnormal growth, abnormal closure, and suture of the uh, different suture. So we have this a specific interaction between the, the different bones, the bones and the dura, and we have different timing, different variation uh, in this uh, interaction that occur during time. And there, we also know that the uh, origin of those cells that interact is different depending on the region which we are. We have neural crest uh, derived cells during the splanchocranium, the frontal part, and we have mesodermal derived uh, cells in the posterior part. So you see that this embryology is complex and this uh, uh, head formation is done laterally to medially. And so we will have the diff lateral uh, parts that will migrate laterally medially in order to create the face and the skull. And these are important elements to remember because they can explain you the pathology, but you can see in some cases there is something wrong uh, in the embryology. From the ossification point of view, the metabolism is very important in these bone diseases, and uh, we have different types of ossification in the skull. Uh, as you know the, from your uh, 
uh, lessons in the uh, uh, embryology of the long bones, we have uh, before uh, cartilage stage, which will become then ossified. This is the same in the on the base of the skull, especially in the region around the foramen magnum, at the limit between the skull and the spine. But it's different in the level of the vault, in which we have uh, directly an intramembranous ossification uh, that will lead to the ossification of the frontal, the parietal, and part of the occipital and temporal bones. So what we have, we will have in the embryo ossification centers. This ossification center will be separated by what will become the sutures. So this region in between this uh, ossifica ossification area and the bone will ossify progressively and the bones will come in contact and create the suture. So at the very beginning, the embryo in the very first months of life, the growth will start from the ossification centers. You will have two at the level of the front, uh, one on each parietal and uh, temporal, and one on the occiput. And then when this is finished, there will be a mechanism of apposition resorption that will lead to the growth of the skull and will allow to have, sorry, the adaptation to the growth of the uh, brain underneath. As, as again, the brain will push the bones, the, the the inner part of the bone will be resorbed and a new uh, cells will, a new layer will come on top. And so you will have progressively an increase of the, uh, the size of the skull. But as you understand easily at this point, there is no much question of shape, but just that of volume of adaptation. And at, at that time, again, the role of the periosteum, the role of the dura mater are essential. So there is a big interaction, not only between the bones, but also with the underlying dura mater and the overlying periosteum, which is the membrane which covers the bones. So we have a very important equilibrium uh, that is needed to have a normal growth. So I'll, if, to summarize, the suture is not just a joint, is a, a, a complex structure with a complex function in which we know only some part of it. As a limited role for the skull volume, because the volume will be dictated by the growth of the brain underneath and by this mechanism of resorption and uh, reabsorption, but has a key role for the skull morphology because when it's closed, the shape of the skull will change. How does it change? It will change because there will be no growth perpendicular to the closed suture. This is an example of normal skull. You see the uh, met, uh, metopic suture, the anterior frontal, the two coronal, the sagittal, and uh, the lambda and the lambdoid synostosis. And if this suture in the middle, the sagittal one, allows you these bones, the parietal bones, to grow and, and the skull to enlarge. If it is fused, this enlargement will not be possible. So there will be a loss of the growth perpendicular to the suture. What will happen with that? The brain will continue to grow and it will grow according to the other uh, direction, which is allowed by the uh, opening of the corona and lambdoid. And so you will have a progressive elongation of the skull parallel to the suture. So you see that the mechanism is quite simple. This is described as a Virchow law. So we will have an elongation, uh, which will be parallel to the suture and a reduction to uh, orthogonal to the closed suture. So because those sutures are always in the same size, or you, the sagittal side will always be in the middle, all clo premature closure of the sagittal uh, suture will uh, lead to this type of deformation, elongation and narrowness of the the skull, and this is called a scaphocephaly. Uh, you will have a long head, uh, uh, the front will grow, the occipital bullet will grow, uh, but the, the, the skull will be very narrow. In case of premature fusion of the uh, metopic suture, the forehead will be narrow and triangular in shape. As we showed at the beginning, if you have the uh, plagiocephalus, one suture will be closed and there will be a scoliosis of the skull and face. And if both uh, sutures are closed, the, the skull will be short and large. So you see that we have a very good correlation between the shape and the type of imaging you can have on the CT. These are old CTs and new CTs. They will show you the same things. So uh, 
what is important to understand is that, of course, the current resource is defined by the simply uh, this uh, fusion of the suture, but it's not more than that because it also affects the uh, function of the underlying uh, brain. It does change the uh, function of the uh, by change of function of the brain, and we will see that. And so there are a lot of questions that still are unanswered. So what is uh, the consequences? What is the natural history once the suture is closed? As we said, we will have a deformation. You see here in a clinical example, the, the skull is narrow, the forehead is uh, protruding, again, a narrow front, uh, the bullet on the back, and a more like a cranial index, which is the ratio between the uh, width and length, which is uh, reduced because the skull is too long. And this is called scaphocephaly because the skull has the shape of a boat, of, uh, is in Greek, uh, scapho is a boat. But it is not only the dysmorphia, there is also an alteration in perfusion. You see, this is an example of the trigonal cephaly. You will have here a, a modification in the shape of the forehead and the perfusion in this area of the brain is altered. So there are functional consequences in these changes. There might be functional consequences in this change of the uh, uh, volume for the brain. The changes are also in the dynamics of the CSF. You see here again, a closure here of the skull, the forehead is protruding, and there is a distribution of CSF, which is abnormal, ventricles are larger than normal, and we can have this problem in the intraventricular, also pericerebral CSF, cerebral spinal accumulation, which are abnormal, might be abnormal in these children. Then finally, there is the problem of this disproportion. You see here in this plagiocephaly, the affected side of the uh, skull is smaller in volume compared to the other side. So there is a reduction for the, in the volume in which the brain can grow. So there might be a problem of compression, a problem of disproportion between the size and volume and the compliance of the skull for the brain underneath. And this will be translated by a modification also in the pressure, which will be inside. So if we record the pressure in these children, you can have a raised in, uh, in the intracranial pressure. You can see the effect of the raised intracranial pressure by what is called the honeycomb appearance. You see these are fingerprinting also uh, images on the, as we said, there is a resorption due to the growth of the brain, but the deposition is abnormal because of the disease of the child. And then there are bone lacuna, there are holes. Uh, the, the, the thickness of the skull is altered. You see here also that the brain itself uh, uh, has this impact of the, uh, this honeycomb appearance. So there is a, a race in, uh, in uh, intracranial pressure and problems on the brain underneath. When we put a monitor of pressure, we put a sensor inside the brain, we can record this uh, pressure. We see that the pressure is increased in a significant number of cases of different type of cirrhosis. So the scaphocephaly is the one I show you, which is elongated. The trigonocephaly is the one in which the front is a triangle. The plagiocephaly is what when one coronal is affected and one side is smaller than the other. And brachycephaly, when two coronal are affected. In when all the sutures are closed or when there are syndromes in which there are several sutures which are closed, you see the risk of having an increase in ICP is even higher. So what are the consequences of increasing raised ICP? One is direct problem on the vision. You can have a papilledema leading to a visual uh, loss by uh, atrophy. And the other is that the uh, chronic raise in intracranial pressure can lead to a neurocognitive delay and neurological problem. So there is a functional problem. It's not only an aesthetic problem, but also a functional problem. What is it also important to understand is that because of the uh, complex embryology, sometimes only the skull is affected, sometimes the skull and the brain is affected, sometimes all the skull and the overall skeleton can be affected. And you see here an example in which also the face is affected, the mid face is retruded, there is a problem of occlusion, you see here the suture are difficult to see, you see here maybe a remnant of the sagittal, but you see the lambdoid disappear, several uh, holes 
on the backside. And in these holes, you have abnormal veins that are drained because there are problems also in the content. Uh, you see also here that there is not much uh, volume for the cerebellum. So you can have a descent of the tonsils so the, the, uh, the cerebellum can be uh, pushed outside the, uh, the skull. The uh, veins that drain the, the uh, brain can be outside and uh, under the skin instead of being the typical jugular veins because of problems of the uh, foramina of the skull in these children. So we can have anomalies in the, uh, the uh, face, anomaly of overall skull, skull volt and skull base. You can have also problems in the extremities. This is typically described in the upper syndrome, which we have a syntactal because of the expression of the mutation. It's typically an FHFR2 mutation. It's a, a, a fibroblast growth factor receptor. It's a tyrosine kinase uh, receptor, which is uh, chronically activated. And depending on the type of mutation, the effect can be different, but in the upper syndrome, it can lead to a syntactin in which the fingers are fused of the hands and feet. And this is also associated to an expression of the mutation at the level of the brain leading to a severe mental retardation. And this syntactin is important to know because it's something that you can recognize in antenatal, antenatal ultrasound, so you can have antenatal diagnosis of this type of syndrome. You can have also other smaller things like you can have a ptosis, you can have a brachydactyl, you can have some kind of mild membranous syntactin, you can have mild modification of the ears. So again, like always in medicine, the clinical examination is essential in order to understand if we're talking on something that concerns only the skull or if it affects other organs. Hey, Fred Richard. <laughs> But you're, you're fabulous. I have to remind a little bit as moderator to keep if we can wrap up a little bit just so we can stay close to our time. Yes. Okay? So we we can have several genes that are affected. So it's important again to understand that we have isolated and non-isolated with problems of the background. So I will go faster now to explain again why it's important, because if there is an underlying syndrome, the management and the, uh, is, will be different. This is just an example. If there is an osteopetrosis, there is the skull problem, but the management of osteopetrosis will be bone marrow transplantation. So the cure is not only surgical, it's also a medical point of view. So this is a pathology in which you need the surgeon, but you need also genetics, you need also metabolic analysis, you need a proper uh, understanding of the problem in order to uh, classify correctly these children based on the clinics, on the genetics and on the radiology because it will change your um, strategy. So very fast to go into the principle of surgery, the problems from the neurosurgical point of view are those raised ICP. Uh, you can see, as I told you, you can have problem also in breathing because of the uh, mid phase. You can have problem of venous hypertension. You can have brain anomalies. But what we can cure are those uh, first elements. So we want to avoid the compression of the brain. You want to avoid the problem of the morphology. You want to restore the dynamics of CSF and. Uh, basically, there are two types of strategy. Either you do the surgery as soon as the diagnosis is done in the very young one, uh, asymptomatic, or you do a curative treatment in asymptomatic children, sometimes older. Uh, so there are several techniques. We are able nowadays, to, we uh, uh, open the, the, the scalp with large uh, incision, and then we can cut completely the brain, expose completely the dura mater, and reshape as we want the uh, skull in order to obtain the good volume and good shape. Uh, so we can correct both the uh, problems of compression and shape. This is an example. These are the orbits that are cut at the level of the forehead. So the forehead and the supraorbital bar, which are replaced anteriorly in order to correct the morphology. So you can change the shape of the forehead, of the, the uh, anterior part of the skull, as you can see here. You can correct the posterior parts depending on which uh, is the area that is affected. You see here again an example posteriorly, and we change and you give room for the brain and for the cerebellum avoiding these problems. The risks are related to this uh, problem of blood losses because of the uh, tissue. So with the skin and with the bone, you have, of course, the risk of damaging the uh, dura mater, 
and sometimes even the brain. So there is a risk of complication, a risk of morbidity, mainly the risk of transfusion is very high, more than 80% of the cases, depending on the different techniques and ages. And of course, there is also risk of mortality. You can also have a risk of recurrence because the, uh, the growth is, will continue and sometimes it can continue, abnormal growth can continue and it's within correction. So risk of redo so. Different techniques can be used, and you will see in the different uh, panelists after me. Uh, so I will go very fast. But what's important to uh, underline is that there are things that are neurosurgeons and other things that will be corrected by maxillofacial ENTs, ophthalmologists, because some you want to improve the neurological issue, but you want also to restore the different function which affect the face. And so uh, sometimes there are surgery that will be done really on the face, on the globe, for the breathing. And so it's a multidisciplinary management uh, with several surgeries that might be needed during time. So with that, uh, I will close down with, uh, because of the sake of time. Uh, and I will leave you with this goal of management. You want to avoid the encephalic compression, you want to restore the CSF dynamics, counteract the progression of the anomalies, and correct the cranial dysmorphy with a multidisciplinary management. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the... Thank you, uh, Federico. A very comprehensive uh, lecture. And now we call Nor Maria that we will introduce uh, Susanna. Nor Maria is the founder of the World Congress of Neurosurgery Medical Students and American Residents. And thank you for the speaking to keep uh, on time. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a matter of a huge honor and pleasure for me to welcome Professor Sushantra Patacherji. She's the Chief of Neurosurgical Unit at Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences in Hyderabad, India. Hyderabad is a very busy city and her institute is a very busy uh, institute, which is uh, obviously a tertiary level institute with, it, with um, a postgraduate training available. So she has um, um, a lot of role in post-graduation, post-graduate training and education. She has uh, um, um, also uh, she's remained as a member coach membership coacher for the ISBN and she has recently concluded her term as executive member of the Indian Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. She has trained shortly at British Columbia Children's Hospital Vancouver with Professor Stan Book and his team as well as uh, with Professor Shalomi Constantini. So she has a wide experience in pediatric neurosurgery. She's been very active in all these webinars and as well as in-person meetings in India. Um, it's a pleasure for me to invite her and to welcome her to deliver her wonderful lecture. Uh, Professor Sajendra, this, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Nancy, Jeff, Rick, everyone in ISPN for this opportunity. So Frederico has actually covered craniosynostosis, so I don't need to speak about that. So I will talk about a little broader things of what are the congenital anomalies of the skull and uh, physiology. I will uh, just touch a bit because the time will not be sufficient to cover everything. So I just start with the quote because nothing has so marked an influence on the directions of a man's mind as his appearance and not his appearance in itself that was told by Tolstoy because we all are uh, we have a conviction that whether it is attractive or unattractive so appearances rules the world as told by Schiller and with this I start my talk so let us know a little bit about the normal infant skull it is flexible enough to get through the vagina. It's called molding. It is expansile enough to accommodate rapid brain growth. So the anatomy, as uh, Frederick has already touched upon, about the various sutures and how the growth happens. And uh, the fact is that at birth, the volume of the neurocranium is eight to nine times greater than that of the face. This ratio decreases to five is to one by two years, three is to one at six years, and two is to one in adults. Ossification more or less completes by age eight and bone union more or less by age 20. Keeping this in my ground, I will come at the congenital lesions. What are they? They are usually not life-threatening and hence underreported or delayed reported. Relatively rare, skull lesions in the pediatric population are common entities and often constitute a diagnostic dilemma for radiologists. In neonics and infants, congenital and benign lesions are more prevalent, whereas in older children, neoplastic and inflammatory origins are to be considered. Whether they may be symptomatic, they may be asymptomatic. 
So what are the various lesions we know of? Variations in the skull density. The density, it could be decreased or increased. It could be either generalized or localized. In skull size, it could be in size like microcephaly or increased macrocephaly. Head shape, calvarial defects or acquired conditions, post-traumatic abnormalities, and of course, because of neoplasia or any vascular cause. So if you look at the skull density, if you look at the decreased density generalized, the causes could be osteogenesis imperfecta, achondrogenesis, hypophosphatasia, and Menkes syndrome in case of increasing rarity. And decreased density localized could be just lacunar skulls. Increased, we have osteopetrosis, we have cranial dysplasial diaphyseal dysplasia. In increased, you have frontometaphyseal dysplasia, more commonly known as the fibrous dysplasia, craniometaphyseal dysplasia. So this is an example of a fibrous dysplasia case. Here you can see the frontal and uh, the orbit. There is a huge bone growth. It's a localized growth. And this was the bump in the head with which the child came to us. What you need to do is just take, open it and uh, shave off that part of the skull. And you can see that the bone is slightly different from the normal bone. And it, uh, it, it looks, and once you do it, it's a, I mean, it depends on the location and it's not a very tough surgery. You just need to know how to use the drill properly. This is another case of just an ethmoidal uh, fibrous dysplasia. This is the post-op picture, actually. The pre-op, he had an expanded nose, and this was a huge encapsulated one. We had to operate on him three times to get his, and now he's 21 years old, and uh, he's studying engineering. So variations in skull size, what we have is microcaphaly that is decreased or microcaphaly. Microcaphaly, the causes are severe hypoxic injury, trisomy 21, 13, fetal alcohol syndrome, Torch syndrome, Rubinstein tabby, all the Zika virus is known and is quite common in Brazil, uh, was uh, reported from there usually. Now it has been reported uh, from many plates. Macrocaphaly, the commonest is hydrocephalus, subdural fluid, collection, neurofibromatosis, achondroplasia, tuberous sclerosis, or a host of metabolic storage disease, Alexander Caravan, Sato syndrome, everything can lead to microcavity. So if you look, these are the pictures where in microcavity, some I took are my collection, some are from the, I searched and took it. And uh, a baby with microcavity, you usually have two standard deviation below the average, and in very severe microcavity, it is three standard deviation but they are very rare cases and this is the statistics. So this is a case of uh, macrocaphaly where there is a congenital hydrocaphalus. You can see there is no cortical mental at all in this child and it was 81 centimeter at six months of age. And you can see the transly illumination, you can just see the whole sagittal sinus with the cortical veins. So this, uh, you actually, they, they don't have head holding and all and they don't survive for long because you really don't know what to do with them. They're just left and neglected in most of the cases. Abnormalities of head shape, you can have a very common faulty fetal packing. The nurse packs so tight that the child ends up with a, uh, with a depressed skull or a positional plagiocephaly or a craniosynostosis as explained by Frederick. Here you can see this is a faulty fetal packing. Here you see the, this one is depressed. Sometimes it's so depressed that you might have to uh, operate, but most of the time they actually, in, with the brain growth, it, uh, it gets corrected. So it's positional plagiocephaly, as you have seen, because of faulty position. Here, it has to be distinguished from a bracket of, from a posterior plagiocephaly. I will not go into the details already explained in the previous lecture, but we need to know that it is a, a parallelogram shape and they may present with torticollis. So these are a few examples of craniosynostosis. I'll avoid it. It could be uh, non-genetic or genetic as like this with various syndactylis, and this is scapocaphaly. I will skip all this. You can see the pressure marks on the, uh, on the skull x-ray because of uh, the constrained environment of the brain within this uh, small constrained skull. And once uh, you release them, they tend to improve and get cured. These are some examples of craniosynostosis. Here, this is a girl with multisutural craniosynostosis. And this is the pre-op and the post-op. And this was at 650 grams baby on birth and later operated at two years of age and now doing fine and some example of Epper's syndrome. I'm not describing them already been done. And this is an example of Epper's syndrome where it's a very severe deformity of the skull. You can see with all these changes and the hypospheres vectors 
activators and all these things. So you get various combinations in these genetic types and they actually they do not do very well because obviously you can see how deformed the brain remains. And this is again a multisocial cranial synostosis and this is simple brachycephaly where both the anterior coronal sutures are actually closed. So let's come to calvarial defect. It could be simple bar holes. It could be defect leading to encephalosis, meningosis, or sinus. It could be parietal foraminus. It could be large fontanelles, simply large fontanelles, neurofibromatous leading to skull defects. Usually the skull-based defects are noted in neurofibromatous rather than the calvarial defect. Langerhals sends histocytosis, cranium bifidum metastasis, leptomeningeal cyst, also known popularly as the growing skull fracture and osteomyelitis. So this is an example of a skull defect of the aplasia cute is very rare, but they happen without any skull uh, formation. And you can directly see the dura. Small ones heal by themselves, but the uh, bigger ones actually needs cover. This is a case of an encephaly where there is that is the brain is exposed in various degrees by the and there is no skull. And this one I don't have a collection of mine, so I took it from the man, and they actually do not survive well. So this is a case of bilateral. These are these are present radiological since we don't need to do them much uh, about them. Their arachnoid granulations can lead to a skull defect. There could be sinus pericranii like this, where the venous dilatation leads to a skull defect. There could be bilateral parietal foramina, but this is uh, this is an autosomal dominant disease, and there's a problem with chromosome five and eleven. You need to know that. Usually we do not need to do anything, and it is covered. But there is a defect. Of the skull growth. So they appear something like this and uh, sometimes there can be encephalosis through them. I'll show you an example later. Now these are some examples of encephalosis. I'm sure Dr. from Philippines will show cases because uh, it's uh, more prevalent there than in my part of the country. And this is an example of an occipital encephalosis where you can see the brain going inside the cavity outside the brain. When there is only CSF, we call it meningosil. Otherwise, we call it encephalosis. There are two types. Um, I mean, above the sinus or below the sinus, and they're the common ones, around 75% of encephalosis are occipital, rest are front to nasal. So this is an example, and this is another example of an occipital encephalosis. The repair is pretty much simple, and you need to repair them, and then it gets cured. And this is an example of a front to nasal encephalosis, where you can see the anterior skull defect, and then there is meningocele and the brain matter coming out through Again, it re, it's a complex surgery, but requires the help of plastic surgeons sometimes to, or, uh, to have a very good aesthetic look. And they are also curable once, uh, once you correct them well. Same thing, this was only a case of meningocele and uh, we could repair them well with the uh, bone graft in the mid defect. And this is an example of an atratic encephalosis. This girl actually came to us with a refractory posterior region epilepsy, and we had to operate for refractory epilepsy. She came at the age of seven years, but she was having this right from birth, and it gradually sunk in. And this was what? This is an atratic encephalosis. And this is a case of a germoid, which, are, which is seen in the midline, and you have to be very careful. There are not very difficult surgeries, but you have to be careful that you do not injure the sagittus Sinus, which remains just beneath the dermoid. And usually once uh, taken out, they remain well. But uh, if not taken out, sometimes they will end up with meningitis. This is again another case of an occipital dermoid. Dermoid, here you can see the swelling in this girl, but this was a very rare case where we have a dermoid. We could not see a dermal pit, but uh, there was a swelling there, and this was the scan findings you can see, and she also had a clippel pill abnormality. So it's a rare case of a dermoid plus clippel pill abnormality. We operated the dermoid, and this was somewhat the operative pictures. You can see that this was the whole dermoid being taken out. You can see the hair and some dirty stuff over there and some dermoids also have tits within them. This did not have. So coming to the post-traumatic abnormalities, if you look, there could be a kephalematoma, there could be fractures, there could be leptomeningeal cysts, popularly known as the growing skull fracture. So this is an example of a kephalematoma. Here you can see the 
peculiarity, this is a bad trauma, you can say, and they are limited by the sutures. They do not cross the suture line and they remain below the aponeurosis, but above the skull. They usually involute by themselves, but sometimes they get calcified and you can get as a very hard lump over the head. So these are examples, this is an example, and then of a chronic calcified capel hematoma. And this is has to be distinguished from caput succedinum, which is a collection of an edematous tissue or edema or fluid. The difference is that they, do, they cross the suture line and they're not bounded by the suture. So that's how we diagnose them and these occur after birth. So this is a very, very rare case of a delayed subaponeurotic fluid collection. Very recently described, the etiology is not known. Only 62 cases reported so far. This, if I report this, it will be the 63rd one in 2021 April. Till then, 62 cases have been reported, but there will be just a swelling in the occipital region, very fluctuant, only CSF, not infected. And the reasons are normal, probably described to be because of microfractures or some collection of blood, which later dissolves, but not the treatment. Treatment, they resolve over three and a half weeks and treatment is just drain it and head bandage. Usually it suffices. So they are not connected inside to the brain. So this is one such uh, abnormal case. And uh, this was uh, what I was mentioning. And this is a case of a leptomeningeal cyst. This was a large head child who was bed bound but had a fall and then had a cyst. And you can see the condition of the bone here. And you can see the bump in the head here where the CSF was coming out. And this was how it looked like. We had to take it up even though, it, and we repaired it. You can see there is again no cortical mantle, only water was there in the brain. We recurred and, re, and decreased the skull size rather than after removing the water. And this child went on to supply, went on to live for next 10 years. After that, he had some chest infection. He, he expired. This was a case of 2007, I'm talking. For 10 years, he survived with the, um, in this condition. So we need to do. It's not that we don't need to do for all large head. We need to do. And they still, they have a uh, some life, even though the quality may be altered. So this is a case of a simple trauma and a subgalial collection like this. And they resolve over time. You don't need to do usually anything. And I'll not talk about this because the next, uh, I think the, the seminar will be on this and it requires a lot of discussion, but this can also cause to various types of uh, head trauma. So next come and the last most category is the neoplasia. What we get in the congenital neoplasia, you can have as a vascular lesion, very common, infant, not very common, but they are known like infantile hemangiomas or at birth hemangiomas. They usually involute by themselves, but sometimes very rarely they can be uh, aggressive and at the time they need and they can turn into malignancy. So at the time they need treatment. Usually they are replaced by fatty tissues when they involute and uh, we do not need to do much about them. Only thing is that it looks scary and you to need to counsel the parents well. So this is a case of a, of a tumor which he had from birth, but suddenly there was, a, at seven years of age, there was a sudden increase in growth. So it's probably a low-grade thing has turned into a malignancy. And this was what we, he came to us in 2000. And then it was an ulcerated, huge uh, swelling in this. Uh, this is the child. And you can see it was bleeding from them. We took up and we operated and removed the whole tumor, which was a huge one. And he went on to survive for five years and he, after radiation, and it was a fibrosarcoma. So, and this is a case of a Ewing sarcoma. They, again, you know, they are the report late and they, can't, they came quite late to us. It was a huge lesion, again done and complete surgical removal was done. And then, of course, I do not know the follow up, up of this case, but then um, he, I did follow up for two years and after that, I don't know what happened. So in conclusion, I would like to say, I have taken up this chart because I found this summarizes of what I have, whatever I could show and whatever said, and this is from uh, Chaudhary et al. from Polish Journal of Radiology. If you look at the pediatric skull lesion, incidentally detected on imaging, it will be arachnoid granulation, arachnoid cyst, parietal foramina, sinus peritoneal, venous lakes, and intraosseous hemangioma. If you look at the visible or palpable abnormality, then you can can see that it is present at birth, it could be capal hematoma, but trauma or congenital depression, skeletal dysplasia, aplasia cutis, venous anomalies, dermoid cysts, sinus, meningocyl, and caplosyl. If you look present later in childhood, it could be asymptomatic, infantile hemangioma, calcified capal hematoma, neurofibroma, osteoma, lipoma, myofibroma, 
it's there symptomatic, then it could be a ling Langerhans cells, histiocytosis. It could even be infection of the bone, which is called osteomyelitis. It could be even some osteosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, leukemia, and metastatic deposits of neuroblastoma. So this summarizes all the congenital anomalies of the skull. So in my conclusion, I would like to say they need to be addressed early. All of us should put our effort in creating awareness and majority of congenital anomalies are treatable and not life threatening and hence the need for awareness. So thank you. And uh, with this, I would like all of you to join the ISPN membership as Dr. Rick has said about the benefits. And I look forward to have you here and that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sushanda. Now the privilege uh, to introduce uh, uh, Giselle Coelho, maybe Martina will be at the end, uh, Linda. Uh, and uh, she will talk about simulation. She is a scientific director of Duxin in Sao Paulo, pediatric neurosurgeon at the hospital Savara, and also adjunct researcher at the University of Sao Paulo. Please welcome Giselle and feel free, please, uh, Keep on time. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation to be here, right, and to talk about uh, simulation and planning treatment for skull anomalies. Um, I think now, now it's perfect, right? Um, we are talking about training simulation in neurosurgery, especially in this moment that impact of COVID-19 on surgical practice widespread, right? And then we have, the, there is a transformation of the operate room routine during months. And then we observe a gap in surgical training. This way, the development of surgical simulations platform is therefore essential to reduce the risk of potentially serious interoperative errors arising for an experience. Then we developed a project that the, the, the proposal of the project um, provide new tools uh, for neurosurgical and STEM education. Then we created the concept that mixed the reality. Then we combined the full 3D virtual reality at low cost using simple cell phones and highly realistic physical model simulators. And then we developed the virtual uh, simulators using some programs like 3DS Max and other programs to create the, to insert the trainee in the three-dimensional uh, environment and to understand the step-by-step -step of the surgery. And then this, this will be the first step. And the second step will be the practice in the physical simulators that they have the, the material with consistency, the, the resistance and textures and mechanical resistance really similar to human tissues. Then it's possible to provide a, um, a training with all uh, tactile feedback. Here we are describing uh, the virtual uh, three-dimensional visualization and step-by-step -step of the cranosinostasis correction. And then uh, the trainee can understand the, the um, each step of the surgery and the osteotomies and the, the place to do that and how to, to do that and the instructors that have to pay attention, right? And here we are describing the H. Henier technique. And then the student first, the trainee will see step-by-step -step of the surgery, three-dimensionally, Right, and using all the materials that uh, they should be used, they should use in the physical simulator. And after having this sim this visualization in three dimensional virtual uh, simulation, he will be able they, they will be able to use uh, in the physical uh, simulator. Here we describe the physical simulator. We created this scaphocephaly type that is most common, right, to train. And this simulator is interesting because we could uh, create with a radiological interface. Then it's possible to, to put the, the, the simulator inside the CT scan. And here we have this image. And we have the superior sagittal sinus with blood solutions, kind of blood solution, and it's possible to bleed with, uh, of course, some damage. 
And here it's possible after the virtual simulation, the trainee will be able to train uh, in the physical simulator. Here is the scaphocephaly type, and we are using the HNIR technique. And step by step, the osteotomy. And here, the most important is to have this tactile feedback, right? Because it's so important for uh, surgical training. And then the green stick fracture, and here, the sagittal strip removal. And here, it's possible to train all the steps of the surgery, right? The bone remodeling and the use also of absorbable plates and to train the technical skills uh, to do that. And also the skin closure in the end. And this simulator uh, is possible to train also the endoscopic approach for chronosynostosis correction. Here we are using this baby simulator, International Federation of Neuroendoscopy, the course uh, organized with Dr. Uh, Giuseppe Tinali in April. Naples, and then it's possible to, to train from the position of the patient uh, to the skin closure. And here we can see the simulation, right? Using the, the endoscope correction, then it's possible to, to simulate really uh, realistically, right? The step by step. Also, the endoscopic approach. And here we can see more details, right? Uh, the osteotomy and the possibility to perform this training. And we thought about that is really works for trainees because it's possible to verify the the reducing the, the reducing of the learning curve. We also created the individual patient customized surgical planning treatment, especially for a challenge case or for a complex case or for cases that we need to, to discuss multidiscipl uh, with him, uh, multidisciplinary discussion with the plastic surgeons, for example. And then we created this hybrid model. The hybrid model we can use the 3D, made, the, the 3D printed and also the plastic artist. And then we can create the consistency, resistance, uh, really similar to human tissues. And then we use in this case for preoperative planning for, for patients, specific patients for surgical training and also for medical education. And the, this kind of model can provide better comprehension of complex anatomy. The limitations yet are time and technical costs involved in this, in this kind of training. But we have a, an important papers, right? That we can see the big advantage of the three-dimensional printing in surgery. And we have uh, surgery time reduced and better preoperative planning and risk and postoperative complications were reduced when you use this kind of, of preoperative planning. Blood loss and transfusions are also reduced and time required under general anesthesia too, anesthesia too. Errors were reduced in general, increasing the safety and reducing the morbidity. Here we are talking about the simple three-dimensional printing, but we can improve these results. And then we create the concept of the hybrid model, especially for residents and for trainees. In this, this, in this case, are not so complex for us seniors, but also uh, help a lot in the multidisciplinary discussion. And here we have a trigonocephaly case. And here we have the hybrid model of the baby is really similar, right? And here, and the 3D printed of this patient. Here we have the skin, the skull, uh, and the, the brain exactly with uh, similar consistency of the real tissues. And here we can discuss with uh, plastic surgeons, right? How would be the best approach? How would be the orbit remodeling, right? Specifically for that patient. And then we can perform the surgery in the simulator before the real surgery. And here we can discuss the challenges and uh, to avoid the complications. And sometimes you can change uh, the surgical technique. Right, well, as Dr. Suchanda well uh, demonstrated, there are many complex cases, especially for encephalocell, and then you can 
we can get practice a lot in, in these cases with customizing in specific um, patient models. And here we can see the preoperative plan, the, the preoperative feature, and the postoperative um, right in, uh, early, right? And here in the follow up of four months, and now. Uh, is the child. For this case, and specifically, we also developed the preparative planning using the augmented reality. Then we can have in the cell phone, we can use the, um, the augmented reality, we can project the holographic image of the CT of this patient, and then we can remove the skin, for example, to understand better the, better the anatomy um, and the alterations of the skull. Right now, this kind of preoperative planning with augmented reality in cell phone is really possible to use uh, widely, right? Without any kind of restriction, because using the cell phone is uh, technology, it's low cost. And then uh, I believe that soon it can be used also like a navigation tool to right uh, soon. Here we, we published this case uh, showing the importance to use the mixed reality model for uh, neurosurgical training. And here we can use the, the virtual reality in the course, right? And it, we note the, the advantage of this kind of training. The virtual reality provides varying degrees of immersion and realism, a perception of physical reality with symbolic, geometric, and dynamic information, with detailed interstructural anatomical relationships, with multi angular vision and simulation of surgical steps with rich three-dimensional visualization. Then it's really important when you, when we added this kind of training, because we noticed the, the reducing of the learning curve, it was really more, most important. And here the using of physical simulator. And the physical simulator, uh, they have many, many advantages. For example, we have a material maintains, maintains no biological risk. They are recyclable. They can reproduce uh, the anatomical uh, alterations, right? We can use the real tools. They are CT compatible, no ethical objections. We can use in hospitals, you can use in labs, you can use in any space, right? All surgical steps can be trained, especially for emerging situations, because they have the possibility to train also this kind of situation. And as we know, there is a evidence level one that the use of simulators improves uh, operating room performance. And here we, we had the honor to be in the covert child nervous system. And there are some publications about this kind of uh, training in, in its impact in the neurosurgical education. And here uh, we have the, we had the honor to receive this uh, Young Neurosurgeon Award because of this uh, use of mixed simulation. And also we publish uh, together with Dr. Nelsi, the neurosurgical um, book uh, talking about the simulation. Then we, we know that the mixed reality simulation can contribute pro, for improving the anatomical understanding must be applied for the best performance in a, in a widespread in surgical training. Especially now, I think that we are discussing a lot about metaverse and the new platforms of, for metaverse. We, we strongly believe that the meta health and the mixed reality simulation will be the future, right? We can really, really uh, provide a, a better neurosurgical education. And the, the future perspectives and how can we modify the natural tendency of technology to train and use it as well to educate. And then we are talking about technology for learning, not only for repetitive, Threats, but also to promote creative thinking, innovative problem solving, seeing chains of innovation, and improving experiential learning and face the unexpected. In medicine, we call it complications. And then this kind of training, you um, can uh, 
bring them the best preparation for trainees and also for surgeon uh, for senior neurosur seniors neurosurgeons especially for complex case and understand what's the real question what's the real challenge to solve and what are the possible solutions and then i strongly believe that we are uh, we will have everything to to use this kind of technology in, inside the meta health concept inside the metaverse platforms in the future. And in Brazil, we started in the last year to try to reduce the gap of neurosurgical education, promote some courses uh, using the mixed the reality. Then you use the virtual reality, they use the physical simulators. And in the end of the, the, the course, we use it with two models. In the end of the course, we are able to um, evaluate these students, and then we can uh, note the reductions, the, the reduction of the learning curve. This is really, really interesting. Here we use the neuroendoscopy uh, simulator and also the cranial sinusoid training, and we use the virtual reality, and we use the augmented reality, and we use also the physical models, and we can train using all the 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 surgical tools and here we can see the the hololens and the possibility to improve the virtual and the three-dimensional uh, the three-dimensional visualization visualization and the virtual environment and here uh, the cranial sinostasis too it's impressive how this learning curve can be reduced with this kind of treatment and i uh, believe that it can be an important solution uh, post-pandemic. And then I would like to thank, because we work in a big dream team, right? Dr. Nelson, Professor Benjamin Worf, Dr. Eberval, Manuel Jacobs, and all the other colleagues and, and engineers and graphic designers that you are uh, with us in this uh, important project. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Giselle, fantastic, like always. Uh, now, uh, Nor Maria, please can you introduce the next speaker and uh, the discussion will be at the end. Please stay with us. I'm pleased to interview Dr. Um, from uh, his Roni Reticulon, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon at the Philippine General Hospital in Manila, Philippines. He completed his pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. He has been trained in ETV CPC, that is in endoscopic thermoventriculostomy and choroid plexus cauterization at the Cure Children's Hospital in Ambel, Uganda. He's a member of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Committee. We are really pleased to have him today as a speaker in our very amazing panel. So, uh, Dr. Roni, the floor is all to yours now. Okay, good day, everyone. So I am Rani Patikola, and I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon from the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. I'm a member of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Committee, and I'd, I'd like to thank the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery for inviting me today uh, to discuss uh, encephalocele in children. So this is more of an introductory talk, and the goal of this lecture is really for uh, the learner to, to, to be able to at least get an idea how he or she would manage a patient or a child with an encephalocele presenting in the clinic. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, what are encephalocele?s So when you say encephalocele, it's essentially you have what what you have is that you have a defect in the calvarium uh, through which herniates meninges, uh, brain, and or CSF. So you, you have a combination of any of those. So for example, if if the sac just contains CSF, then you would call that a meningocele. If it's got CSF and meninges and brain, and you would call that the meningoencephalocele. Uh, sometimes you might also, in our part of the world, you also just call them nasal. All of them are generally called nasal ethmoidal meningoencephalocele or nasal ethmoidal meningoceles. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the more correct term will be either a meningoceal or a meningoencephalocele. So what's most important here? The, they are classified based on the anatomic location of the skull defect. So most of the time you would see these children with masses in the midline. So the masses are usually midline. 
the skin covering can be thick or thin, and, and you have, it's the location that will tell you how to name it. Uh, it, can, it can be primary or secondary. When you say secondary, for example, if it's due to trauma, sometimes you could, you could get head injury, injury to the skull, causing herniation of brain and or CSF. Uh, and I would show a similar uh, a case of that later. The incidence is between 0.8 to 3 per 10,000 live births, and it represents about 10 to 15% of all neural defects. So as I've said, the most important thing is to try to identify where, where is exactly is the encephalocele. Uh, anterior encephalocele or syncipital encephalocele are more common in Southeast Asia, Central Africa. So for example, in our setting here in the Philippines, we more commonly treat syncipital encephalocele. Now, these encephalocele, encephalocele's, they, uh, in the original paper by Suanuela and Suanuela uh, in the 1970s, they divided this into three. Uh, nasofrontal, nasoethmoidal, and nasoorbital. I'll show a diagram of that later. Uh, and then you could also have your posterior encephalocele. So your posterior encephalocele, they are more common in North America and Western Europe. Now you, ha you have to look at the landmark, I said, at the bony landmarks of the skull. So what are the bony landmarks you should look at? Uh, it is very important to look at the encephalocele in relation to your lambdoid suture. So if the encephalocele uh, arises anterior to the lambdoid suture, then we would call it an interparietal encephalocele. If it is uh, after or posterior, so for example, so if the lambdoid suture is around here, if it's more anterior, then that would be an interparietal encephalocele. If it's below that, then that would be an occipital encephalocele. Now your occipital encephalocele, they usually divide it into two, your supratorcular and infratorcular encephalocele, depending on how the sac is related to the torcula. Uh, then you would also have your basal encephalocele. So your basal encephalocele is there innate, not outside of the color environment, but towards the base of the skull. So you see here, these are just diagrams showing you. So here, as I've said, the anterior encephalocele are more common in our setting. Uh, I will be showing examples later in the posterior encephalocele, such as this one, the parietal and the occipital encephalocele. They're more common in, 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 in uh, uh, high income countries than in our part of the world. So again, take note, if it's above the lambdoid, that's a parietal encephalocele. If it's below the lambdoid suture, that would be an occipital encephalocele. This is the original description of syncipital encephalocele by Suanuela and Suanuela. Uh, so the syncipital encephalocele, the anterior ones, so we divide them into a nasofrontal. So you see here, this is a nasofrontal encephalocele. So you look at the nasion. So if the sac herniates above the nasion, then we would call it a nasofrontal encephalocele. If it herniates uh, below the nasion, then we would call it the nasofmoidal encephalocele. And if it now herniates laterally though, and involves the medial orbital wall, then that would be a nasoorbital encephalocele. Now here on the top view, you can see the basal encephalocele. So the basal encephalocele, they will not herniate outward. So they don't present as midline nasal masses. Uh, instead, see, these patients may present with recurrent meningitis or nasal congestion and then an imaging, or they could just be incidental findings, and then you see a, uh, an encephalocele. So here, just to give you some examples, this is, uh, these, these are all children with midline masses. So you see here, the encephalocele sac contains, so you see the, the, the defect in the bone, and you see this is the nasion. So we would call this a nasoethmoidal meningoencephalocele. So this would be a nasoethmoidal meningoencephalocele. So we've got brain and CSF herniating through the defect. Now this one, uh, if you look at this patient, so you see here, there's the encephalocele sac, and you see how it exits partly through the medial orbital wall on the right. We would call this a nasoorbital meaning the encephalocele. Uh, this one is a pure frontal encephalocele. So this is associated with the facial cleft as well. So you see we've got brain and CSF, so, and then that's a, that's a bony defect. Uh, this is a posterior encephalocele. Now look, this is the lambdoid lambdoid suture right here. So this is since this is the lambdoid suture, and you can see that the sac is anterior to the lambdoid. We would call this interparietal encephalocele. This is another parietal encephalocele. Now, this is an atretic encephalocele. Now, atretic encephalocele, they're skin covered. Uh, they could be just a palpable mass. Most of the time, you don't need to do anything about it, and they, they, they could be just fine. So how, how frequent are they? As I've said, uh, there are about 10 to 15% of all neural tube defects. This shows, this is a systematic review from 75 countries. And this shows you the incidence of your encephalocele in relation, uh, compared to your anencephaly and your spina bifida. So they're around 10 to 15% of all neural tube defects. So how do they form? 
So the problem is that in, in, in encephalus, there's a sustained connection between your neural ectoderm and your surface ectoderm. So normally the surface ectoderm is supposed to separate from the neural ectoderm. If that doesn't happen, then you don't have the mesoderm or the bone that forms in between. That's why you've got the bone defect. And when you've got a bone defect with the brain pulsation and CSF pulsation, they will now begin to herniate. And over time, this will get bigger over time. Uh, they have associated anomalies listed here. Here are some syndromes associated with your occipital encephalocele, most importantly, your Meckel syndrome. And for your frontal encephalocele, that will be your amniotic band syndrome. So these are just things you should look out for. So what do you do when you see these patients in clinic? So how do you actually assess them? So these are patients we've seen at the Philippine General Hospital. We published our series in Child's Nervous System. Uh, my, my colleagues published our series a few years ago. So what you see here, how do you evaluate them? So these are all sensipetal encephalocele. As I've said, ask yourself, where is the lesion? Is it anterior or is it posterior? Okay. Is the lesion ruptured? Now, this is important. As we all know, uh, it matters because if, if sometimes, especially in low and middle income countries, these patients present to us quite late. So they do not come to us during the first few weeks of life. They come to us much later. And so you have to ask whether these lesions have ruptured because if, if, if they have, then you worry, you begin to worry, have is there this patient at risk of infection? You have to treat the infection first before you repair the encephalocele. Uh, it would not be a good idea to repair encephalocele when they're infected because otherwise your, your repair would just break down. Uh, does the patient have concomitant hydrocephalus? So as high in some series, as high as two thirds of patients would have concomitant hydrocephalus. Now this is very important to know. Why? Because if you've got hydrocephalus and you don't address it properly, and then you do your repair, what would happen is that the pressure from the hydrocephalus would just result in CSF leak. Your repair would fail and you would get infection, ventriculitis, meningitis, and it would be very hard to pull the patient. Now, what are the associated problems? Ask yourself, is vision being compromised? If you've got a typical encephalocele, is, is the vision of, one, on, on that, of the eyes being compromised, which makes you want to do the repair earlier on? Is there brain stem dysfunction? This is more important for your posterior encephalocele. Is there brain stem herniating through the defect? Has the patient got carry malformation? Does the patient have seizures? So uh, what do we do then? So most of the time, what we request is a cranial CT. The nice thing about a cranial CT is that you get an idea about the bony defect. So I've said, this is very important so that you could plan your repair. Uh, you could also get, so you could also make the accurate diagnosis. If it's a sensipetal encephalocele, it would be a good idea to include facial and orbital cuts, just so you're sure that you're getting the, most, the inferior most portion of the sac. And so you could plan your repair accordingly. If possible, you get a 3D reconstruction. You could readily do this now with free software from the internet. And as necessary, especially when you're dealing with posterior encephalocele, you might need to get an idea about the venous anatomy. Ideally, you get an MR venogram, but most of the time with a CT with contrast, you, you more or less get an idea where the veins are. So for me personally, if I have a patient with a posterior encephalocele, I would try to at least get a CT with contrast so that I know where the vessels are. Uh, what are the goals of treatment? Number one, you need to close the skin defect. You need to make sure that this, 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 this sac, this antrenating brain is, is skin covered. Otherwise, this patient will be forever at risk of infection. You need to close the bony defect as well. Now, there are two schools of thought here. Some would not actually cover the bone and would just repair the skin defect. Just make sure there's enough skin covering the defect. But uh, some would set a cutoff. Now, there are no hard and fast rules, but the problem is if you don't repair the bony defect, uh, over time, the encephalocele, the, the patients will come back to you again with a protruding mass just because of brain pulsation. And then you try to preserve viable normal tissue. So uh, there are people that argue that most of the herniated tissue is already glial tissue. And these are not actually not, this is actually non-functional brain. But uh, if, you, if you, there have been several studies published already that they've actually done uh, functional MRIs where you see this uh, herniating brain sliding up. Uh, personally, uh, what we've done is that we usually just sacrifice. Uh, we try to achieve, if sometimes you really have to sacrifice brain, a brain tissue or scar tissue just to be able to close a defect. And we've not had problems with it. So how do you plan for your surgery? Most important for me, you plan your skin closure before you make your skin incision. Uh, it's always a good idea to try to leave uh, skin first. So don't try, don't try to remove all of normal skin right away when you cut. 
because you know even if it's very thin skin if, it, if it's, it's all the skin you've got that's still good enough and that will still feel well uh water diet Dural closure is essential. Now, this is the most important part of the surgery. You need to make sure that you repair the dura properly. If you could not repair it properly with primary, with primary intention, then try to graft it using pericranium, even fascia lata. Uh, I tend not to use artificial dural grafts in children. I, 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 I personally observe a higher incidence of CSF lead with this. So as much as possible, I try to use uh, native tissue. So as I've said, when you're doing work anteriorly, you could easily use the pericranium. If the pericranium is thin, you could actually use temporalis fascia if you don't want to harvest uh, your fascia data. And then as I've said, uh, whenever possible, use a graft to repair the bony defect. So I will show you later examples of where we get the bone graft. You can either split the calvarium uh, or you can harvest from adjacent bone. And then address the hydrocephalus. Now there's a question in whether to address the hydrocephalus first before you repair the encephalus seal. Again, two schools of thought. There are people who repair the hydrocephalus and the encephalus seal in the same sitting. There are people who prepare to shunt first before they treat the encephalus seal. There are no clear cut recommendations in this. It's really depends, it really depends on your setting and your experience. Of course, if you've got ongoing infection, it would be best to defer uh, shunting until infection is cleared. How to avoid complications? So the most common complications when we repair encephalus would be wound adhesions, CSF leak, meningitis and ventriculitis, and vascular injury. So if there's hydrocephalus, treat the hydrocephalus first. If it's if the repair is urgent, you might need to put in an EVD if there's still got if you've still got infection. And then once you've cleared the infection, then you put in the shunt. Uh, if the child has no infection, if there's fluoride, if there's massive hydrocephalus, you can do it in the same setting. Uh, CSF leak, just make sure you need to do a water diet or a closure. For vascular injury, just make sure you, re you review the images free off. Prognosis and outcome will really depend on the amount of neural tissue within the antifalcial sac. Of course, for Chiari 3 malformation, where you've got brainstem herniating the, the, the neural defect, they've got a lot more problems. So you, you've got to, to make sure to explain to the family that the goal of surgery is really just to prevent infection, CSF leak, and the developmental outcome will really depend on, on the overall picture, the neuro, the neuro, neurologic status of the patient pre -op. We will now go through some illustrative cases. As I've said, this is our series of cases of uh, in sensipital encephalus seals where we usually do it in our plastic surgery team. Uh, the majority of them did not have uh, any complications. Uh, most common complications were CSF leak and surgical side infection. How we would do it? Uh, some centers would prefer, would prefer single sitting intracranial and extracranial repair. So where, where they remove the mass. So the way we do it, we do it in one sitting. So you see here, this, is, this, is, this will be where the nose is. This is the forehead, the eyes are here. So we, what we tend to do, we use a small frontal craniotomy and then to try to identify the neck. And then we ligate, we ligate the sac, uh, excise the brain, and then put in the bone graft. The most important thing here, close the dura properly. And then how, where do we get the bone? We either split the frontal bone or if the child is less than two years old, we can get bone here and then just transfer it there. Okay? And we all know that the harvest site will soon develop its own bone because dura is still oxygenic at that time. Another case here. So here, this is a nasoethmoidal encephalus seal. That's a sac. That's a, I, I must admit, I could have used a, a, short, a, 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 a shorter uh, craniotomy here. Uh, this is really all you need. So here you see the sac. The, my, my advice here is to work from the side. Uh, again, work from normal to abnormal. When you're doing your dissection, uh, my preference is to try to work from normal to abnormal because you never know how thin this gets. And as I've said, I, 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 the, the difficult part is going to get posterior. The most difficult part is make, making sure you've got enough tissue posteriorly where you could suture your dural graft later on. And this is the dural graft. I use pericranium here, and then I just use bone. So in our setting, uh, plates are very expensive. Absorbable plates are very expensive. So what we try to do, we've been doing our repairs using two OPDS. So we usually use two OPDS features to anchor our bone grafts. And these are our outcomes. So you can see here, we do the repair in one setting, both intracranial and extracranial. So again, this is several years down the line. So here, so when you've got this patient, as I've said, 
you don't just worry about the sack. You worry, in this patient, what we're worried about was the vision. So that's why when this patient came into us, this patient was from the province. Even though this just got thick skin, we needed to repair the encephalocele sac urgently. Otherwise, this patient was at risk of getting blind. So this is a nasal orbital meaning encephalocele. So this is how we did the repair, bicoral incision, and then plastic surgery also did this to repair the encephalocele sac. And this is how the patient looked and follow up. When you got something like this, they can look very impressive, but when you look at the scans, the bony defect is actually quite small. So this one, we did the pure extracranial repair. So we didn't have to do a bicoronal incision. So we just did the pure, the pure extracranial repair and harvested adjacent bone to try to cover the bony defect. Right. Other centers would use box craniotomies, box osteotomies. We tend not to do this because most of our patients don't actually have, they, uh, they usually just have uh, telecanthus rather than uh, hypertellerism. So most of the time you find that if you just repair the soft tissue, that should be enough. This is a parietal encephalus. You know, for your posterior encephalus, you you position them prone. This is what I like to do. I usually use an elliptical incision, either vertical like this, or sometimes I use a transverse. So this is a parietal encephalus. So as I've said, it's above the lambdoid. Very important to study the venous anatomy just to make sure there is no sinuses. So you can see here that there's usually a plane between the sac and the subcutaneous tissue. So that's what they usually try to do. I dissect it. I usually try to find that plane. Now, this is the bit that I usually do. I make sure that I'm able to expose the bone circumferentially. As you can see here, what the way to do that right, is to try to feel the bony edge. And then two to three millimeters from it, try to use your monopolar cautery. And then what you try to do, you push with the pen field, you push that soft tissue inward so that you could expose the bony edges. So for me, it's very important to expose the bony edges. Why? Because if you don't expose the bony edges, if you put your bone graft there, that bone graft will just die. That bone graft will just die. So it's, as I've said, it's very important when you do these surgeries. So you can see here, this is the encephalus healed sac. So we just coagulate that. The other thing here, to avoid vascular injury, when you do something like this. So what I try to do when I coagulate, when I amputate this, I don't amputate very close to the circumference. So I try, I try to leave a thin film tissue so that if there's a vessel right there, I could still easily coagulate it. Otherwise, if you cut here deep inside and the vessel retracts, it would be very hard to chase. And it will be a lot of headache. And this is the patient post up. So I've said planning is very important. So you see here, you've got to use a slightly bigger incision to encompass the parietal bone graft site. This is an infant with a posterior neck mass. This is a carry three malformation. So you can see this is an occipital cervical encephalocele. You could see, again, very scary. So it might appear very scary because you've got brainstem, blood vessels in there. Uh, positioning these patients is very tricky. Uh, again, you need to make sure all pressure points are padded. The eyes are no pressures on the eye. Uh, the way I work with these cases, you know that the vessels are midline. So the way to do these cases, you work from the sides. You work from the normal anatomy from the sides and then try to work your way to the midline. That's the safest way to do it. So in, and then as I've said, I usually try, I don't coagulate very close to the inside. So I usually work about two to three millimeters from the bony edge and then amputate there and then close, watertight drill closure. And this is post-op. Now, however, several days later, the patient presents with abnormal breathing, with, with difficulty breathing, with stridor. And when we repeated the scan, we could see that the ventricular megaly has increased. So this patient required a shunt. So something to take note of when your patient, in your patients with occipital cervical encephalosis, occipital encephalosis, they're at the risk of KRE crisis. You need to watch out. So you could see, you, you see the ventricles pre are just fine. They're a bit big, but not too big to put in water at the shunt right away. The head circumference was normal. But once we remove that sac, remember the CSF circulation will be altered again. And this is what happened. So this child ended with the shunt, but on follow-up, she was doing well. Finally, this is a child, a teenager referred to me with recurrent meningitis after head injury. And what we see here, when we did the scan, you can see there's a frontal, basal frontal fracture. Uh, so the patient was being treated with antibiotics repeatedly. And when I finally got to see him, or when we finally made a diagnosis, so this is just a post-traumatic basal encephalocele, and we, we repair that using the same technique. 
So we put in the bone graft, tried to suture, and the patient went home fine. No more meningitis episodes. I'd like to acknowledge the neurosurgery residents at the Philippine General Hospital for helping me take care of these patients. Now, this is how our hospital looks at night. I'm on Twitter at Ronnie Bats if you've got questions. Thank you again to ISPN. Ron, that was an exceptional talk, and I hope that the students can recognize the amount of experience and exposure that was just presented in the last 20 minutes. Uh, that's a talk that, that was a treat for all of us. Ron is an expert. That region of the world gets a disproportionate share, and Ron has just shared with us uh, a greater experience than many of us will have the opportunity to, keep, to accumulate probably over an entire career. So great talk and thank you very, very much. Um, our next speaker, we're gonna continue on with our speakers. Then we're gonna see what questions arise from the uh, participants, from the students, if you will. We still have Martina's talk that we're just kind of holding. It's a recorded talk because she had another obligation that came up after she already had written and committed to giving a talk. So let me introduce um, Danny Campos. Uh, Sanchez, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon at San Borja National Children's Hospital Institute in Lima, Peru. He's completed a residency in neurosurgery and fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery and is a member of the ISPN. Um, so Danny's going to uh, uh, talk to us about an overview of the long-term follow-up in craniosynostosis. So uh, if you'd like to screen share Danny and take over, we're, we're keen to hear what you have to say. Can you see my screen? Very nicely, yes. Okay. Um, um, first, thank you for the Attendance Survey Committee for my invitation. I'm so glad to be part of the education, educational course. So, um, uh, Grand anastosis is a, a, a top, uh, very challenging topic, and well, and um, and we, I, I am going to talk about, about uh, long-term follow-up, but first I want to talk the long-term follow-up in cranial and synostosis has some limitation, limitation about time, limitation about variety of patient symptoms, especially related with age, different surgical strategy and strategy have been changed over time. New techniques have been introduced as distraction of osteogenesis, occipital expansion, sprint technique. Um, different surgical team uh, use different uh, surgical strategy, even in the same hospital. And sometimes it's difficult to determine whether this improvement was induced by the surgery of a normal child growth. Um, normal cranial growth is necessary to achieve long term satisfactory ball morphology. But we know that uh, normal growth in patients with cranial synostosis is compromised. So uh, this uh, complex interaction between dura, skull, and, and uh, brain surface and external forces uh, in the setting of uh, premature close suture um, Produce different, it's called deformity. Um, well, different, different reports have to try to evaluate this long term result. Um, some with few cases, on some of them with a uh, short period of following, and some of them uh, fail to establish the relationship between the surgery and the outcome. So the routine follow-up with this patient include observation of the cranial ball growth, of timing examination, uh, uh, rule out signs of increase, uh, raise ICP, as heat a neutral vomiting, development of delay, irritability, visual disturbance, this is very important, decline academy performance seizure. And of course, it's more frequent in patients with multiple social involved or in case of um, uh, syndromic sinuspasm. Uh, it's multifactorial and may develop gradually in, in patients, usually before six years of life. 
So when we are concerned about race ICP, we have to do fundoscopy examination uh, to, to rule out papilledema, CT on MRI is, uh, of the head, invasive intracranial monitoring sometimes. And aesthetic result, uh, well, here we have a wide variety of concept. Now, in that degree of which further revision is important to patient and his or her family varied that before widely. Um, in this routine follow-up, of course, it's important to rule out uh, pressing on hydrocephalus. 10% of patients need training before uh, the procedure uh, to correct uh, sinus losses. Because this is a uh, educational uh, course for students, it's important to uh, emphasize the increased ICP by suggested by clinical, radiological, as beating Cooper appearance, in, uh, as you can see in the uh, right picture ophthalmological to rule out papilledema or in basal ICP monitoring in some cases. Um, uh, the Whitaker classification is, is used to assess the post-operative post appearance. Uh, in this classification, uh, the class three and four show us a worse um, evolution after surgery. You know? Uh, the number three uh, in, in, in include major alternative bone revision of grafting and visible by no extensive of the original surgery. But the number four uh, reveal a failure of the initial surgery. We need to make a major craniofacial operations. Uh, during following weeks, sometimes we uh, see also delay complication of stimulitis, reaction to material using surgery, so uh, head injury, ocular proptosis, ocular imbalancing, um, persistent bone defect, and recurrence. This paper is interesting because this analyzes demographic, morphology, and surgical factor in patient when syndromic and not syndromic sinus um, This approach, this topic, um, is in three points. Uh, initial presentation in surgery, repeat surgery during follow-up, and functional outcome. Uh, the number of patients evaluated with syndrome and no syndrome patients were 51. As you see, um, age at the initial surgery was significantly lower in syndromic group. Yeah, these types of patients have severe several scones, so and many times they have um, more probably signs of increased ICP. So, uh, they usually have uh, early surgery. Um, the average is 9.8 against 19.9 in the no syndrome patients. What about repeat surgery? We also see that syndromic patient has a higher incidence of repeated surgery. 30% of patients with syndrome group have um, a repeated surgery, as you see. Um, um, Patient who underwent initial surgery before six months of age were more likely also to undergo repeat surgery compared with patients where surgery is performed after six or after 12 months. In the indication of reoperation, the most frequent cause of indication uh, cause for uh, reoperation was uh, signs and symptoms of intracranial hypertension, cephaly to proarbitalization, recurring or new sinus losses, calvarian defect cause. So, syndromic patient by coronal sinus losses and patient operate before six months uh, had higher Whitaker class three and four. And these types of patients have uh, a reoperation uh, more frequently. Don't forget that re recurrence up to morbidity and may the surgery prompt complication, like the eruption of the for example. And what about functional outcome? Um, the spectrum of retardation is pretty wide. Uh, uh, for example, motor development of delay, mental retardation, gay delay, hyperactivity. You know? uh, in this paper, there's the uh, was not found significant difference between the no syndromic and syndromic group uh, when we're talking about our general intelligence. But 
uh, they found that initial surgery before six months from age is reported to provide a very full scale IQ and performance IQ at 10 years of following. Um, this paper show a very interesting point. This is a long-term anthropometric follow-up in patient. Um, we know syndromic and syndromic renaissance. So as you see, after surgery, head circumference is better uh, in the in next few months. But uh, after one year of surgery, uh, patient syndromic and non syndromic patients show a significant decrease in head circumference. In the same way about cephalic index, uh, after one year of surgery, a significant decrease was seen in granular ball growth, but so um, definitely there is uh, uh, other factor related with uh, growing of the ball, the granular ball, otherwise the uh, remedy closure of the decision. And I said before, an accentuation of growing impairment occur one year after surgery. And this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this concept is very important. Even in patients with excellent postoperative results, the value for head circumference and granule index show a trend toward preoperative value. Scaphocephaly, trend to be a scaphocephaly again after one year. Um, and what about uh, sagittal sinusosis? This paper compared two types of uh, surgery procedure using calvarian remodeling and using modified straight anatomy. Again, after the next few months uh, surgery, um, there is a important recovery that cephalic index. But after one year, this is a stable in the, uh, over time. Uh, they get better result using a calvarian remodeling. Uh, this is very interesting paper over 224 patients. And, and what about head circumference? They also, well, in general, patients with sagittal brain sinusosis have a preoperative head circumference markedly elevated compared to the normal population. But over time, they are closer to the normal population bar, but it's still, uh, still greater than the normal population. No? Yeah, about the five years of following, these patients uh, are near to the, 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 the average in, of normal population. Um, age at the time of surgery did not influence outcome in cranial ball remodeling, but it's important factor in patient uh, underwent um, a strict craniectomy. Uh, this is possible related with the uh, velocity of growing in the uh, very young children. And what about um, trigonocephaly and thereoplagocephaly? Yeah, this paper uh, used this technique, it used a strict for uh, anterior, um, uh, anterior plagiocephaly and for uh, trigonocephaly. And they follow in this patient. In both cases, uh, they underwent orbitofrontal bundle. Um, there was no important difference between the two groups, um, but um, trigonocephaly was more frequent in, in, in male, and plagiocephaly were more frequent in female. And the male age nine was similar. But what about the result? As you see, oh, in general, trigonocephaly and, and anterior plagiocephaly have a uh, very um, aesthetic uh, travel. And as you see, when they evaluate this patient, they found that the grade three and the grade four on the Whitaker classification were the more frequent. And um, over time, uh, and during following, and during following, this patient had some residual deformation as uh, as a uh, high forehead um, um, or mid frontal bulging, or in the case of uh, coronal 
uh, raise ilateral eyebrow in nasal deviation. Uh, when they, uh, uh, that's why they have a high incidence of reoperation surgery. And it's probably because they, they use help, helmet therapy at the same time. That's why they, uh, this, uh, this aesthetic and functional results were very poor. Um, um, because of this, it may probably better use a kind of remodeling to, to get better aesthetic results. Well, what about their county outcomes? Oh. Um, Neurotonic complication uh, we can, uh, is more frequent in patients with grand sinus, especially patients with um, syndromic patients. No? And this patient in general have a greater tendency to suffer from neurocognitive impairment during infancy as well as school. Um, uh, some paper um, show that there is no different in general um, IQ, but uh, most of them tend to fail below the average. Even uh, when in that general intelligence, these patients suffer from speech and language development, these are special skill, memory, and attention. Um, and developmental quotient is based on physical, adaptive, social, emotional, cognitive, communication, in, in this, uh, and the, there are different tests to evaluate this point. There are factor, patient factor, environmental factor, and management factor that they maybe have a relationship with a developmental outcome. Some with limited evidence and some without limited, some without evidence. For example, um, what about patient factors? Um, the associated brain pathologies are the major factor proposed to play a role in the neurocognitive outcome. As you see in the picture on the right, this deformation of his face may, uh, may affect the growing or the, um, uh, the um, subcortical structure may have, are affected for this formation and shape. And as these papers show, uh, subcortical structure are in conjunction with cortical changes. Uh, Intracranial malformation, brain anomalies, race ICP, or the severity brain fashion deformity maybe play a role in, in this neurocognitive outcome. Um, genetics is also important. Uh, expression of gen genes may be role a, a, a great um, play in this neurocognitive outcome uh, in more than the just uh, early closure of the suture. And the time sinusthrosis, um, there is no particular type that has been found to be a good or bad prognosis, but there is a trend that the sagittal granule sinus is performing better than other. Um, there are no strong evidence for environment factors. And uh, what about management factors as well? We believe that the more the surgical correction is delayed, the less of the changes for the brain to recuper recuperate. But there is different uh, condition to, to related with the time of surgery. For example, recent infancy, severity of skull defect, risk of failure, uh, syndromic or non syndromic, um, cultural characteristics, etc. And of course, it, the, the type of, of institution. Um, even though the insult may happen during infancy, the effect of the insult may be detected only after child failed to acquire the skill. Uh, that's why many patients are treated older, and that may uh, affect the development and growing. And what about effect of surgical um, correction? Well, Report have demonstrated resolution of puppy when well, when race ICP is documented. Uh, report have demonstrated resolution of papillomima, improved IQ, and developmental progress following cranial ball extension. And this is very important. And poorer 
cognitive function in those with elevated ICP presenting after three years old. So measures from home. Well, post-operative result represent a snapshot in time and does not give any starting or further granular development or study. Um, syndromic patients have more severe skull deformity and may require early initial surgery. Uh, the recommendation is a spacious approach. Uh, patients who underwent initial surgery before six months of age were more likely to undergo repeated surgery. Um, some other recommended uh, overcorrection during surgical skull remodeling or granular dosis to improve cranial ball growth and aesthetic outcomes. Uh, in case of raised ICP or poor cosmetic outcome, reoperation may be indicating in the for tailored surgery. Uh, influence on surgical timing on neurodevelopment remains unclear. Some reports suggest that post-operative mental outcome is better when the surgery is performed before the 12 month. And finally, these children are at risk of development, developing cognitive and behavioral disability in their school. So the following is very important in these patients. Um, thank you again for an invitation. This is my institution, San Borja National Shrine Health Institute in Lima, Peru. Thank you. Danny, that was a great summary and it focuses our attention on what is often overlooked, which is the long-term outcome, right? As you very correctly identify, what gets reported as outcome in our published literature is a snapshot, right? Where are kids at 12 months or 18 months or whatnot? But you, you raise the very important point of the dynamic quality of craniofacial work. And um, we appreciate that and the other long-term points that you've drawn to us. So I just want to draw to everybody's attention the very substantive questions that are in the chat right now. Many of the key issues surrounding craniofacial surgery and um, encephaloceles have been raised by astute um, observers in the questions, and the, the speakers have answered in some detail. But we did want to provide some time here at the end for more live questions. Now, there are too many people on for us to meaningfully do show of hands. So what we'll do is, is that we'll kind of open up the chat for questions that you might like to pose live to the examiners, or pardon me, to the uh, speakers, excuse me. Um, and, and while we're waiting for, for that to go, one of the key things that was raised in the questions, Ron, was the whole role of treatment of hydrocephalus in the treatment of Encephaloceles. How aggressive do you get up front? And how, like, do you put EVDs in everybody? What's your rate of shunting? Is ETV? Maybe you could expand on that for a couple of minutes while we have people posting in the chat. And then I'll be quiet from here. And, and Nelsie will. Put Jeffrey? The, yeah. Just a minute before they are thinking about the answers. Very interesting question. Just to advise the audience that uh, the lecture from uh, Martina. Initial evaluation and surgical indication for craniosinososis will be recorded on this uh, webinar and they will be available for every attendee that are with us. And she is uh, now uh, president elect of the German Neurosurgical uh, Academy of Neurosurgery. And congratulations for her, is the reason that uh, she recorded the lecture today. And uh, apologize for uh, interrupt a little bit. No, I'm glad you did. It's super important because Martina is a super experienced person. And I would personally commend that talk to everybody to, to take the 15 minutes or 20 minutes of that talk and listen to it because Martina speaks from great experience, uh, both operatively and in the ISPN. So, uh, uh, Ron, do you want to just comment on the hydrocephalus thing and then we'll turn it over to the questions? Thank you, Jeff. As I've said in the talk, it's very important to recognize hydrocephalus when you're dealing with the patient with encephalocele because it's hydrocephalus that will really lead to a lot of trouble later on. So first, so what do I do? I look at the head circumference. So as we all know, ventricular megaly is not necessarily hydrocephalus. 
So if the child is grossly macrocephalic, if the head is obviously very, very big, and you've got a very, very thin skin covering the encephalocele sac, I would tend to address this hydrocephalus right away, which means I would either shunt the patient first uh, and then do the surgery for the encephalocele repair a few days later. Uh, I've also done it where I've, uh, in, 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 in where I've put in the shunt and repaired in the same sitting. It really depends on your resources and the availability of over time. Or for example, the problem is some of our patients live far away and if you shunt them first, they won't come back for the encephalocele repair. So those are the things you need to consider. Uh, it, if the patient, however, for example, has got a normal head circumference, very thick skin overlying the encephalocele, I think I'm going to be able to achieve a good dural closure uh, even if the ventricles are slightly above average, if, even if they're slightly enlarged in the ventricles, I would tend to just do the repair first, but I would monitor these patients closely. As I've said, as you, you've seen in the slides, in the patient with the Chiari 3 malformation, I didn't put a shine in right away, even though the ventricles were big, but recognizing that these things could happen. And that's the most important thing. You need to monitor these patients closely because if you decide not to put in a shine, then you have to watch closely. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I, if the skin, if I don't think I will be able to close the skin very well, or if, if the tissue covering the sac will be very, my repair will be very, very thin. And then even if the hydrocephalus is just borderline, I will just repair, I will just put in a shunt first or do an ETV. I've also done ETV CPC first before doing the repair. And, and it's a different talk altogether because uh, the Ugandan experience has also shown very good results with ETV CPC in kids. And, and just like many others, I'm also trying to try to replicate their results, but, but my, my success rates have also slightly, slightly lower than theirs. Thank you very much. Um, we have a lot of questions about simulation. I would like to, uh, to have uh, the, some words uh, from Giselle because they are asking how we can manage. But before your answer, I would like to hear from Professor Boop, our ISPN president, how we can combine uh, this opportunity to, to training young uh, neurosurgeon in low and middle income country with uh, some investment like in this practical course. Uh, if you have some advice, because several people ask the same question. Yeah. I think it's a, a great opportunity. I was really impressed by Giselle's use of a handheld cell phone uh, to do simulation. And so that's something that can be done in countries around the world. Uh, just like we've historically done simulation for ETVs. So I would be interested to see if the companies that support this technology uh, would help us put on courses at least at our annual meeting in Singapore, if not in some of the educational courses we put on through your committee around the world. It's a great opportunity. Thank you, Professor. Thank you all for the message and the questions. And I strongly believe that's possible to organize something for Singapore, for sure. It'd be great, and if we ever come up with a good app, from, from the ISPN with all this integration in that particular app, it will be very helpful, especially for the trainees, because most of us are using our cell phones and we have like a like an app known as test surgery. You might have heard of it and might have used it as well. Um, when we were, uh, when we joined our training back in 2015, we had that app and we used to um, uh, perform those craniotomies there. Uh, have, like um, this, it was a very wonderful way to game to use. This was uh, a good learning experience. I hope you can develop an app, or maybe we can provide some um, um, some type of a 3D or virtual reality kind of webinars in in the future because they can be very helpful for everyone. Um, I just made a test run from one of my other webinars where we could uh, introduce Anna Glives, and we can just instruct people to use their 3D glasses. To have a good experience so um, uh, i think that you can just take uh, you can extend uh, your uh, amazing things to another level of education and so congratulations on all those all of your achievements that, that was a wonderful futuristic talk i'm impressed really. everyone is impressed right oh. now thank you thank you maria for your kindly words 
And yes, you give us many ideas. In the end of the year, the last year, we developed the transnasal approach and the scopic approach for virtual reality. And then our residents receive the glasses, uh, the, the glasses as, as cardboard, like the Google one, it's simple one at home. And then we, we discuss uh, during three days, um, uh, case of macro, hypothesis macroadenoma. And then they could watch and with using your, the, their cell phones in the cardboard and to have the three-dimensional visualization. We are writing this uh, paper right now and the results were very impressive. It's just to, to improve a little bit more the comprehension uh, through 3D, 3D uh, right, visualization. Thank you very much, Giselle. There is a Thank you, Dr. Uh, to Danny Campos. Uh, besides uh, intracranial hypertension and cosmetic results, there is another function to uh, craniosynostosis surgery. Did you see other uh, indications? Um, well, um, during four, well, I, 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 Dr. Rebook said the important of the following um, uh, include uh, cranial bone, uh, the discharge, um, increased ICP, um, the um, visual disturbance. But uh, there is other consideration during follow-up as uh, academic performance. Um, uh, Neuropsychological uh, development. Neuros uh, de no, no, sorry, there is a kind of relation? Yeah. Uh, there is no strong evidence for establishing a relationship. It's, it's true. But some uh, papers suggest that the importance of the... Um, uh, the that the compromise and the development uh, uh, in these types of patients, especially with patients who uh, develop raised ICP. Um, um, uh, um, oh, how would I say um, Well, uh, if we are concerned about ICP, we have to do uh, um, uh, fundoscopy examination, uh, CT or MRI, um, even though uh, in basic intracranial monitoring. But I, 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 um, it's important to highlight that we need a very common following. Our recommendation after surgery is to uh, following every three months in the third year and, and every six months in the second year and once a year in the next uh, year, till uh, six or seven years that apparently there is a risk of develop rice ICP. Um, uh, well, I, uh, with our evaluation, we ask at the same time of ophthalmology evaluation, yeah, and neuropsychological. Uh, we are a, a new institution and we uh, have a, um, a, a small experience, a small experience and we, um, we have a limited team. So we, we don't have all specialties in our institution, but uh, these are the recommendations. Thank you very much. There is other question for you, Sushanda, about uh, surgery in, on sarcoma in on the skull. If the patient will be uh, receive radiotherapy, did you plan cranioplasty at the same time or you delayed the cranioplasty after the radiotherapy? Uh, you are mute, uh, Sushanda. Unmute yourself, please. Uh, after, Thank you. After six yeah, we waited for six months and did the cranioplasty in this particular kid. And because there's always a chance of skin breakdown whenever you do it immediately after radiotherapy. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind those uh, uh, attendees, we have a Google form 
forms at the end. You are invited to fill this Google form, but don't worry, we will still open one hour after we end this meeting. It's very important. Uh, we can have your feedback for improve the next, uh, next courses. Uh, the mic is open to everyone. Madam, we do have a question uh, to Dr. Ronnie uh, from Dr. Umar Farooq Raina. He's asking, how do you manage CSF like in basal and cephalus seals if that occurs? Uh, so if we're talking about leak after your repair, so I tend to be very aggressive with, with these patients. So I, I can never sleep with a CSF leak uh, because you know, uh, you know, even if your patients develop meningitis, ventriculitis, that's when the IQ drops. That's when, when everything, the, the hospital just goes long, much longer and the patient spends so much more. So uh, although many would try conservative measures first, like fluid restriction, lumbar drain insertion, it's very, very difficult in kids. Uh, it's very difficult in kids. So what they usually try to do, I just bring them up to the operating room, uh, plan for a better drill graft. For example, I, I, I find if, if I use pericranium in the first instance, I try to prepare uh, temporalis fascia or fascia lata just to, to, to get a more uh, durable uh, drill closure. Uh, as I've said, uh, there are really no clear cut recommendations when it comes to this, but, but uh, my, my, the key point ah. in September is uh, do not let CSF leak persist for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna try conservative measures, uh, you need to set the timelines. For example, if it doesn't improve in two to three days, then bring the patient, just bring the patient back to the OR. So it, it just drives home the point. You must do it right the first time. When you do your first surgery, you never compromise. So really try to get normal dura to suture your graft to during your first surgery. Thank you. Uh... We have time for more questions. Uh, we are almost running uh, our two hours uh, course. Uh, did you see uh, at least one uh, his hands uh, try to see if we can answer and reach the people, Linda? Just one question. Mm -hmm. Naza Nasser? Uh, yeah, I have, yeah, yeah, I have a question about uh, how can uh, we are in the low development uh, countries. We don't have uh, synthetic uh, dura. So how we can do this uh, repar reparation of uh, the leak, leak of LCR after uh, the surgery of uh, myelomini drusilla? Thank you for your question. Uh... My aluminum seal, usually we try to avoid foreign material. We try to close with uh, uh, fascia from the patient or muscle. If we have a plastic surgeon with us, we try to close uh, in a terminal, terminal way or uh, with some flaps. But if we are alone, we can do uh, muscle, fascia, and try to close uh, at the same time without any other uh, foreign material. I don't know if you have other advice, the more experienced uh, people here. I would just add the one thing that the materials you use does not matter if you don't have control of CSF dynamics in, in myelomeninga seal. You've got to control the CSF dynamics, the hydrocephalus. They can have and often do have hydrocephalus without big ventricles because the CSF is leaking out the back defect. So there's no force to drive the ventricles to be big. So the cornerstone in our experience, um, which always pales compared to experience in other parts of the world, but in, in, with, with that modification, the cornerstone is controlling spinal fluid dynamics. And whether in your practice, that means ETV, ETV, CPC, a shunt, an EVD, those are dealer's choice that should reflect your experience and practice preferences. But it doesn't matter if you have the most perfect material in the world, it will not be effective if you don't have good control of CSF dynamics. 
Thanks, Jeff. It's correct. Time to time, we put a VP shunt on uh, postnatal myeloma negocio if we have CSF leak, uh, avoiding reoperation because it doesn't work. Reoperation if you don't solve the hydrocephalus problem. And Elsie Suchanda has her hand up. She has tremendous experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask Ronnie a question. Uh, do you uh, do you always use bone or when the gap is very high, do you use, uh, contemplate using titanium meshes and fix it or you just use any sort of bone from the frontal, parietal, whatever? So this is where the age matters. So if the dura is still osteogenic, so for example, if the child is less than two years old, ideally less than one year old, then they usually try to harvest bone. Uh, so, so, as, uh, I, so for example, it's, it's a frontal defect. I could just get one in the high parietal region. Uh, if, 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 if I can split the frontal bone, we split the frontal bone. I, I don't like titanium mesh for, for kids. I don't, I tend not to put implants on kids, on my kids. So, uh, just like most of you here, I'm allergic to implants for young children. Uh, so, so that's what I would do. That's what I, so as I've said, now, if the defect is less than one centimeter, some people would actually not bother with putting in a bone graft. Uh, but personally, uh, what, what, what you can do, for example, if it's a small defect, what you can do is you do a craniotomy and compassing it and then rotate the bone flap so that, uh, so that the normal, so that where you've got the repair, it will now be covered by bone. So the problem is, remember, when, we're, when you do the repair, that part of the is abnormal. So that will not generate bone on its own. So when you switch, so when you invert, when you rotate the flap, you now got normal bone over the abnormal dura and defective de a bony defect where you've got normal dura that will just regenerate bone over time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Linda, you can put uh, the question on Google Forms for the for the people. Can you show up to? Thank you very much for your collaboration with the discourse. Uh, Madam, whether uh, if, uh, while it is a very rare or um, not a very common occurrence, uh, but I think that um, there should be a little uh, discussion about the occipital encephalocele, which are associated with the Dandy Walker uh, malformation. It is a rare occurrence, but uh, sometimes people do have a little concern about it. Um, some of us actually happen to see uh, those cases, although I'm not in, um, not working at a pediatric neurosurgery unit, but uh, a colleague of mine came across that um case um, in some other city of pakistan so i think it will be very nice if someone can share their experience about the encephalocele occipital encephalocele that is associated with the danny walker malformation it was a question maria to run it's right uh, yes, sure if anyone else can uh, want to add up it would be very nice it would be very informative Thank Association, you. yes, Ron. I, I have not personally managed a case of a patient with encephalocele and Danny Walker malformation. I think we need to be certain first that this is indeed Danny Walker malformation because these patients with encephalocele they tend to have arachnoid cysts everywhere. So that, that's the other thing. So when you've got an encephalocele, most of the time they've got an arachnoid cyst, and you need to make sure that the arachnoid cyst does not communicate with the encephalocele sac uh, because otherwise, I've said this can be another source of CSF leak. Uh, I suppose you manage it the same way as any other as as as, as, as any other uh, hydrocephalus patient with uh, an encephalocele. If 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 there's pressure involved, or if you're worried that the 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 the, the, the cyst or the the uh, cyst from the Danny Walker malformation communicates with the encephalocele sac, then you would need to address that. Otherwise, you would just get a CSF leak. The other thing is, is that uh, you, you need to you need to uh, take note of the venous sinuses. Uh, as you all know, your Danny Walker malformation, they've got a displaced torcula. You've got to evaluate how it relates to the encephalocele because I said, when you do the repair, again, I, for me personally, the safest way to do it, you work from the sides. So you work from the side because that way you're working away from the big veins because the big veins will always be in the midline. The big veins will always be in the midline. And you just need to make sure you're working with PIA so that the PIA protects the underlying vascular structures. If you're working on the PIA, you, you should be fine. You can just push the vascular structures inward. 
just continue on in your comments. Uh, we try to avoid midline incision in small children because uh, time to time is open suture and we are with residents or young neurosurgeon. We always uh, prefer transversal uh, incision on the skin uh, exactly to avoid exposition or the, maybe uh, in the case where uh, the suture is open on the midline and uh, came from the normal tissue, but you did a very good job. Thank you. Uh, we are running uh, 10 minutes uh, after our two hours. Uh, just to remind the, uh, the attendees, we have already the Google Forms on the chat. Please go in there and fill uh, the questions. Uh, we still open one hour after we end uh, this, uh, this meeting. Please go there and uh, try to, to answer these questions. Uh, maybe final words for uh, each one or it's open. I, I just like to say thank you to all the speakers for a fabulous session. They were beautiful lectures world-class lectures, and uh, I feel like I learned a lot. So I hope all of the audience can sign on for our next module next month, and uh, we'll be sending out the list of scheduled speakers for those talks as well. Thank you very much. And Thank please, you, Rick, for being with us. Fantastic. Absolutely. And and the privilege. Don't, forget, don't forget Dr. Martinez's talk, still out there on the webpage. Very, very worth 15 or 20 minutes of time. Yes, thank you for reminding us. And the next model will be in July 29, on Friday also at the same time. Uh, hope uh, you can join us and continue this webinar together. Thanks for all the speakers to be with us, for your time, for your energy. And thanks for the attendees. You are the reason that we are here trying to do our best on education on ISPN. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank Bravo. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.